Good afternoon. Welcome to this Gander at the Gospel. I'm Pastor Dave Schreffler. I'm the pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Lemoyne. It's time to take a Gander at the Gospel. It's been a week since I've had a chance to do this. Two weeks, probably. And uh, what? But we take some time to take a look at where the Gospel is calling us. The Gospel for the uh, Sunday appointed for the upcoming Sunday, which would be June 21st, 2020. Uh, so we need to see how God might be calling us through God's Word. This gospel is from the gospel of St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the 12, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even if the hairs of your head are all counted, and even the hairs of your head are all counted, so do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. So not only are we going to read the gospel, but I'm also going to read the Old Testament text. This comes from Jeremiah 20, verses 7 to 13. O well, Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed, Jeremiah says. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge upon him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous and you see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm sure you've probably heard of this uh, phenomenon called cancel culture, this uh, mass movement that uh, coming, oh, probably from 2015, maybe earlier than that, but uh, an attempt by a, a large group of people on social media to try to get somebody fired or uh, get them removed from uh, a position or uh, some other way to dogpile on top of someone for something that they have either tweeted or some optics that are out there uh, about them. It's happened to so many in the last three years or so, some, some justified, certainly, in some manner or form, others uh, maybe going to more of a ridiculous level. And I'm talking about people like uh, Brian Williams, and that goes back a number of years. Uh, more recently, Amy Cooper um, and uh, Justine Sacco. Maybe you remember the famous case of Je Justine Sacco. But uh, can't your, can't cancel culture is a way of boycotting uh, or shaming or, or 
or humiliating a person um, because of something that maybe they say that, that others find objectionable. This past week, it happened to uh, coach, a football, college football coach Mike Gundy. He was on a fishing trip with his son. They, there's a picture of him on Twitter. He tweeted out a picture of he and his son. They have all these fish in front of him, and he's wearing a T-shirt. And the T-shirt has the letters O-A-N on the, uh, the front of it. I had no idea what OAN1 was, and apparently it's a conservative radio uh, broadcasting network that is uh, supportive of the president, and, and uh, one of his players uh, found it objectionable that on a fishing trip or that his coach would be wearing this T-shirt. Um, and so instead of going to the coach and having a, one-on-one -on -one conversation, which I think is something that we should do. Uh, instead, he decided he would try to humiliate his coach on Twitter, and it began to take hold. But, you know, in my mind, this is what cancel culture is all about. It becomes the judge, jury, and executioner, and, and without people thinking that perhaps they're too quick to judge, that, they're ha that perhaps they're they're being a little overly sensitive, uh, but it also becomes a, a way to cyber bully if, if uh, you know, I don't know if you are going to agree with me or not, but um, usually uh, cancel culture is propagated on, you know, celebrities, people in high profile positions, but it, it's become a problem in uh, regular, uh, I say regular, in, in uh, people that, that I know that have been canceled, let's say. I have two parishioners from my congregation in Duncannon that decided after being cyber bullied by friends and family, they decided to go dark on Facebook, meaning they deleted their Facebook pages because uh, friends and family didn't agree with their political stances. And uh, I'm sure, you know, like a lot of people, they needed a good heaping helping of holier than thou soup and decided that they wanted to uh, uh, speak against and, in a sense, cyber bully uh, these two uh, friends of mine. And oftentimes people feel justified to speak about things that they really have no place to speak about. But um, that is the culture of cancel culture. And maybe you've canceled somebody from social media in your lives. Um, but I think cancel culture is beginning to erode free speech the right to free speech in our country today, um, if it hasn't already uh, begun to do that. It, it, uh, you know, even Pres President Barack Obama uh, declared that this is an activism, cancel culture. He said, and I want to quote this, cancel culture is not bringing about change. If all you're doing is casting stones, you're probably not going to get that far. If all you are doing is casting stones, you're not going to get that far. Now, I'm not always so certain about my biblical memory, but didn't Jesus say to a group of men who brought to him a woman caught in adultery, didn't Jesus say, you who are without sin may cast the first stone? And not one man remained to cast the stone. Casting stones is a popular sport. In America today. Don't get me wrong, sometimes we need to cast stones, but I better stop talking about stoning people before you cancel me. Um, let, let me ask you this question. Have, have you ever heard of mimetic theory? Mimetic theory. There was a French philosopher of social science named R Rene Girard who defined mimetic theory as the observable, observable tendency of human beings to subconsciously imitate others that will then extend to the realm of desire. Think about the pet rock uh, craze of the 70s or the beanie baby craze of the 90s, the fidget spinner craze of the 2017s. No one knew that they needed these items until Advertising people told them that everybody else had one, so you better get one. That's mimetic behavior. And human beings are mimetic creatures. Our consumerist society is based upon the idea of duping people into thinking that they need, want, or desire X, Y, or Z. 
So it will increase their status. It will increase their popularity. And that mimetic behavior includes canceling people from social media. We don't know. We'll never know. Never care about knowing how participating in dogpiling on them may actually ruin that person's life. We watch how others are canceled because of unfortunate tweets or undeserved judgments of character. And secretly, we hope that we can cancel someone in the name of holiness. Jeremiah was a prophet. And he, lament, he laments in his uh, prophecy that I read earlier. Uh, that proclaiming God's message to a people who don't want to hear it or who ears are going to be stopped up, who believe that they are holier than thou, that this is too much for him to bear. And these people continue to mock Jeremiah in his proclamation. Jeremiah is facing a true dilemma. He suffers if he doesn't proclaim God's word because he can't keep that message in, and yet he suffers if he does proclaim God's word because he's made fun of and he's made fun of and he's mocked. Now, Jesus presents a different kind of dilemma to us. Uh, it's in his, in his proclamation to his disciples in Matthew. Jesus says, and let me quote, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, not peace, but a sword, to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus is giving a message of non-conformity, the opposite of mimetic theory and behavior. A message that speaks to us about not following in the ways of, of society, not blindly or subconsciously following what all the others around us are doing, judging others, stepping on the backs and the necks of the marginalized, the outcasts and the sinners, while we delude ourselves into thinking that we're better than others. Jesus calls us to choose a way of living in the margins, to identify with the nobodies of society, the oppressed, the last, the lost, the least, the little. Discipleship, Jesus says, is to contest society's version of reality. Society says that the more money and stuff we have, the more blessed we are. Society says that the political and the wealthy elite should go first, while the rest of us schmucks should go last. Society says that the rich and the wealthy and the politically connected should receive the best medical care, should receive the best of care and compassion, while the last lost least the little should just get the crumbs that are left. Society says to be on the lookout to point out the speck in your neighbor's eye, all the while ignoring the log that is blinding your own sense of perception. And while society might try to convince us that the cross is a way to keep people in line, that the cross is a form of behavior control. God sees the cross in a completely different light. Listening to these texts today, the one from Jeremiah and the one from Matthew, uh, we might think that violence and cancel culture and living a holier-than-thou way of life is the answer. For Jeremiah, he tells the people that God will come like a dread warrior. Jesus used the imagery of a sword, saying, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And Jesus, his coming does seem like a sword, right? His ministry often uses the sword of division. He divides the money changers from the temple, telling them, you will not turn my father's house into a den of robbers. He tells the religious leaders that their understanding of the scriptures divides them from the true message of the Messiah. That they are blind to the true understanding of the basic teachings of scripture. You see, the sword 
that Jesus is speaking about is a sword that dupes society into thinking that they know the best way. Building their houses on sinking sand, the sinking sand of the I know better, I am better, I should be the first and the only society. This allows us to delude ourselves into believing that our own needs, our own judgments, uh, our own wants and desires are the most important things in life. And all that means is soon we are subconsciously living a life that is a lie. Living lives of desires to have what others have, the desire to judge those that we deem unworthy, and to heck with everybody else. We will just cancel those people. Jesus will turn that sword of thinking into the cross of compassion and love. Jesus says, those who draw the sword, die by the sword. He says, instead, take up your cross and follow me. Those who lose their life for my sake will find their life. Those who lose their life for my sake will find their life. We hear those words and we suddenly think, has Jesus duped us? You mean Jesus' discipleship is not about Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, or Jesus loves the little children? Living the life of discipleship, whether it calls us to proclaim the message like Jeremiah, proclaim God's word even if we are mocked, even if we are persecuted, even if we are laughed at, um, or, or we know that we're proclaiming it to people with deaf ears. Jesus teaches his disciples to be fearless because those who kill the body cannot kill the soul. And everybody who acknowledges Jesus before others, Jesus will acknowledge before the Father. That is true discipleship. And it's not always easy. And it's not always positive. It will not always be met with open doors and open minds, especially because it, it rails against society's idea that I should be first. I should be the only. I will cancel you because I disagree with you. That kind of elitism that pretends to be righteousness, but is actually against what God stands for. Christian discipleship require us to seek positive mimesis, not negative mimesis. We're to, we're to imitate Christ, not imitate society. Paul says, imitate me and imitating Christ, 1 Corinthians 11. Instead of imitating the desires of societal hoarding, the desire to kill any message of any person that we deem offensive just because it makes us feel bad, Instead, we're to desire to live the Christ-like life. And that means we should live without fear. Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. Be afraid of the one who can kill the body and the soul. Live without fear. You are more important than a sparrow. Second, acknowledge the love of Christ in all you do, even if you are mocked, even if you are persecuted, even if you're canceled by your friends. Remember that we are dead to sin. Number three, remember we are dead to sin, but alive in Christ. And that we are not alone. We are not forsaken. We are not duped. Jesus loves us. Like Jeremiah admitted that the Lord prevails upon him. The Lord prevail, prevails upon us through unconditional love. And this should change how we live. Instead of desiring what other have, or desiring to shout down anyone who doesn't think like us, we should desire to live the Christ-like life, to share love, mercy, and grace with all people. That is what it means to live a life of positive mimesis. And that's why we need to share the story of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus, which calls us to love our neighbors 
and to love God above all things. We stop living through negative mimesis, subconsciously trying to hoard and grab and cancel those who disagree with us. When we choose to live in positive mimesis, then within that vacuum within us, when we get rid of all that negative stuff, there's a vacuum that gets filled within us, filled with the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. We will be filled with positive mimesis. And then like Jeremiah, we can find that we can't keep that kind of good news inside of us, that it begins to well up with us, that we have to share it because it burns within us. Take the risk to seek positive mimesis, beginning by being willing to walk in the mile of the shoes of your neighbor, especially the one maybe you just don't like. So that's my gander at the gospel. I hope it's given you some words to, to ponder over in these uh, days to come. Uh, remember, your faith is not the uh, theologian you follow. Your faith is not uh, what church you go to. Your faith is an active, living, breathing, living the Christ-like life, loving God, loving your neighbor. Be someone's thankful today. God bless you.